Now we're in the book of Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 9, and because this week we celebrate the anniversary of the Reformation, I want to tell you a story about Martin Luther, the great reformer, and perhaps this will identify us even more with him, those of us who are Protestants. In the uh, bubonic plague of the 16th century in Saxony, Germany, uh, brought great ministry challenges to Luther and caused them stress and anxiety. And one day, his um, wife, Katharina von Bora, served him breakfast to make a point wearing a mourner's robe. And puzzled, the reformer asked her, well, who died? And then she said, and I'm paraphrasing, apparently God did by the way you're living. And the point is, the reformer who led the church towards restoration of biblical truth apparently forgot that the same God who raised him for such a time as that would also restore his joy. Now, I want you to know, church, that God has not died in 2020, even though we may be facing a global crisis or whatever. Jesus rose from the dead, and that gives us great joy. And I want you to see his power to restore, and that's what we're going to see today and he will restore even what's beyond hope, perhaps a reputation, perhaps uh, relationships, or even a health problem if it fits within his sovereign will to do so. Our Savior has restored our life, and so let's remove the mourner's robe, and let's celebrate, and let's dress for the occasion. He has given us unspeakable joy. And in the words of Ezra and Nehemiah, I want to say to you, church, do not be grieved. For the joy of the Lord is our strength, according to Nehemiah 8, verse 10. Now, in the book of Matthew here, he concludes the third triad of miracles here of chapters 8 and 9 by proving the divinity of Christ, the Messiahship of Jesus Christ. That's his point. Remember, he is telling the whole world, specifically the Jews, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah. And he does that by displaying now previews of kingdom realities. Remember, the kingdom of heaven, Jesus is offering the kingdom of heaven uh, to people, and then Matthew selects miracles and, and scenes here to demonstrate that Jesus Christ is the king. But I want you to listen to a messianic prophecy, two of them actually, from the Old Testament, that Matthew proves that Jesus Christ fulfills. Isaiah verse 29, verse 18 says this, On that day the deaf will hear words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind will see. In, in Isaiah 34, verses 5 through 6, Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. Then the lame will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will shout for joy. In our text today, G, uh, Matthew demonstrates that Jesus Christ fulfills these messianic prophets, prophecies. You will remember in Matthew 5, verse 17, that he says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the, the law and the prophets. And the narrative here then features three responses to that reality, the sympathy and the divinity of Christ. Um, some people react in faith, as we'll see here, two people react in faith. Others show amazement. And tragically, some religious folks came to a tragic conclusion that unveils the evil of their hearts. And we will look through all of that. So open your Bibles to the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. We're going to read verses 27 through 34. And the Bible says this. As Jesus went on from there, two blind men followed him, crying out, Have mercy on us, son of David. When he entered the house, the blind men came up to him, and Jesus said to them, Do you believe that I am able to do this? They said to him, Yes, Lord. Then he touched their eyes, saying, It shall be done to you according to your faith. And their eyes were open. And Jesus sternly warned them, See that no one knows about this. But they went out and spread the news about him through all, all that land. As they were going out, a mute, demon-possessed man was brought to him. After the demon was cast out, the mute men spoke, and the crowds were amazed and were saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees were saying, He casts out demon, demons by the ruler of the demons. So church, what I want you to see here is Jesus' power to restore. Here confirms his sympathy, another word for compassion, as well as his divinity here. And uh, we will see that. I want you to see that in, in the five observations that we'll make according to what the text tells us here. First of all, we're going to divide up the scene in its natural uh, parts here. And first of all, I want you to see a determined request. 
verses 27 through 28, a determined request. Now the two blind men heard that there was a miracle working in, in town, and they suspected that the one here that they heard from, or that they heard about, possessed divine attributes. Perhaps they knew a little bit of the prophecies in the book of Isaiah that we just read, the messianic prophecies, but um, that the Christ would restore its sight to the blind. But interestingly here, Matthew says nothing about the cause of their blindness here. We don't know, and because that's irrelevant for us to know. The only one thing we know here that Matthew lets us know is the word that they used here to cry out for mercy. In fact, the word that Matthew quotes them as saying is kradzo. And that word means uh, literally the shriek of a raven. In other words, this is an onomatopoeia, which means a word that sounds what it means. And we are very familiar with that. We use it in our English language. For example, we speak of the roar of the lion. That's an onomatopoeia. We speak of the buzz of the bee, or the meow of the cat, or the boom of the explosion. So it's the same thing that's happening here. This is an almost unintelligible word that became known after um, so many years of use. But Matthew is telling us here, these guys were so, uh, they were organizing so much in their hearts that it was almost indescribable. They, were, they could almost, um, it was hard for them to describe the agony of their hearts. But somehow they managed to get the words out. And when they asked Jesus for mercy, they're, ask, they're actually asking him for pity. That's what the word means. In fact, the word that they use means literally a covenant honoring mercy. In other words, they recognize Jesus Christ as the Messiah. And he's ask, they're asking him to fulfill his messianic promises on them. They're saying the Messiah is here. So therefore, let's ask him to fulfill messianic prophets on us and demonstrate compassion why because we know that the old testament uh, prophesies about that this is the messiah the messianic age is here the king is here and he is a compassionate god therefore we're going to be the object of his compassion and the reason we know that also is matthew wants us to know they use the title son of david which is a messianic title now the only uh, instance of that expression prior to this in the gospel of matthew is in the very first verse when Matthew says the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So these guys knew that Jesus was who he claimed to be and they hoped to be healed, both physically and spiritually. Now, one thing we need to know here is that the Jews of that time considered blindness a curse. In other words, they, 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 they thought that those two guys were cursed of God. And the reason we know that is because even the disciples me, uh, misunderstood that. We know that because of what they asked Jesus in John 9, verses 2 through 3, when they said this, Rabbi, who sinned, referring to a blind man, this man or his parents, that he would be born blind? And Jesus answered, it was neither that this man was, uh, has sinned nor his parents, but it was so that the works of God might be displayed in him. In other words, there is no such thing as uh, him being cursed because, uh, because of a curse of God. But no, he's being used, referring to this other blind man, of, uh, so that God can display his power on, on him. And maybe they misunderstood what God told Moses in Leviticus 21, verse 21. No man among the descendants of Aaron, the priest, who has a defect is to come near uh, to offer the Lord's offerings by fire, since he has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the food of his uh, God. Now, they obviously misunderstood this passage because this is speaking about the priests, not everybody else in the community. Anybody who considered uh, the blind cursed but by God misunderstood clearly the words of God to Moses in Exodus 4, verse 1. Listen to this. God said to Moses, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes him mute or deaf or seen or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? In other words, there's no such thing. I determine, my sovereign will determine what's going to happen in people's lives for my glory. That's what God is talking about here. So obviously God had not cursed those two blind men, but their own people had alienated them. In fact, because of their uh, status of cursed of God according to the people, no one would come near those guys. They would have been alienated from their people. But they realized that Messiah had arrived, that Jesus Christ was here, and they pursued him diligently. So much so that they even went uh, into the house with Jesus Christ, risking being kicked out of the house, being, risking being said, hey, you have no business being here, get out. But they know that Jesus Christ is full of compassion because they have heard of Christ. Remember, 
in chapter 2 um, that uh, Jesus Christ knew of people's faith. In, the, in another miracle here, uh, Matthew tells us that seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralytic, Take courage, son, your sins are forgiven. So they knew uh, that Jesus Christ was full of compassion and Jesus Christ knew of their saving faith. Therefore, he honored their saving faith by saying, by interacting with them here. And by now we see a pattern here, church, of uh, the compassion of Christ here in the last two chapters of uh, this gospel. And the pattern is this, church. Jesus always responds to genuine faith. In other words, anyone who will come to Jesus Christ displaying saving faith genuinely, Jesus Christ will respond and he will honor by giving that person save, uh, 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 salvation. Now, when you recognize your need of him, he will not turn you away. When you recognize that your greatest need is the saving touch of Jesus Christ, he will answer you and he will give you eternal life. But you need to realize that you deserve condemnation and that Jesus Christ, by his grace, withholds judgment from you based on his merit on the cross, not on, your, uh, on anything you can accomplish. You will be saved, the Bible says. Which leads us to the next point. Not only do we have a determined request here but number two in verses 29 and 31 we have a divine response so we have the determined request and now the divine response and what jesus does here he touches the untouchable once again no one would have dared come near those guys no one would have touched those guys or even approached them because they were considered cursed in their community but they display saving faith in Christ. And because they displayed saving faith in Christ, they dis uh, Jesus Christ gave them a preview of the kingdom of heaven. And we've been talking about this. That's, that's a key term in the gospel of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven. And that's the preview. In the kingdom of heaven, no one will be blind. Everyone will have glorified eyesight, physically speaking. And also, obviously, spiritually speaking. Jesus Christ restored their physical as well as spiritual vision. Because he saved them, finally, he could only, he, they, could only, they could see the world. Um, but not only that, that they could only see uh, people from a divine perspective, from a divine worldview. So we don't know if they were born blind. But perhaps this is the first time they ever saw anything. But spiritually speaking, they now had a biblical worldview. Why? Because um, Jesus Christ restored them. And the same thing happens when Jesus Christ saves people today, whether or not he restores our physical eyesight when you became a believer in Christ for the first time in your life you are now able to see God for who he is you're able to see people for who they are and you're able to have a world uh, a biblical worldview you will have the correct view of self also and let me remind you that contrary to the worldly perspective the correct view of self places you in the category of undeserving sinner who has been saved by the grace of God. You see, what the world wants you to think is that you are entitled to a comfortable life. What the world wants you to, to believe is that God owes you salvation. If only you do enough good deeds, then God has to take you to heaven. Furthermore, what the world wants you to see is that you are above everybody else. But no, according to the biblical worldview, none of that is true. God doesn't owe us anything, only judgment, but we, He withholds that judgment because of His mercy. And He grants salvation, He grants forgiveness of sin because of His grace. That is the biblical worldview. And if you are a born-again believer in Christ, if you are a subject of the kingdom of heaven, you are now able to see this and you are able to understand biblical truth because God has restored your spiritual vision, your spiritual eyesight. Now, and you will see others also from, from a biblical perspective. And that biblical perspective is all over the New Testament. For example, Philippians 2 verse 3, Paul says, Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind. Regard one another as more important than yourselves. You see, if you don't have a biblical worldview, you will never regard anyone else more important than yourself. You will believe that you are more important than everybody else. But according to Scripture, is uh, w w if we have the biblical worldview, if God has restored our spiritual eyesight, we are to regard one another as more important. In other words, I am at the bottom of the totem pole. Consider me last. Let me be a servant of all. Because the Bible is very clear about that. If anyone wants to be first, he must be very last and be the servant of all. So, Jesus provides a contrast here. Uh, and I couldn't think of a better way to explain this than by quoting the, the very words of Jesus Christ. The contrast between the spiritually blind and the one whose spiritual eyesight has been restored. This is what he says in Luke 18 verses 10 through 14. 
Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and was praying this to himself, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I pay tithes to all that I get. But the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, the sinner. I tell you, this man went to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but one who humbles himself will be exalted. You see, church, that is the complete opposite of a secular worldview, of a non-biblical worldview. And only people who have been cured from spiritual blindness can apply this truth and can accept this truth. Because unless God transforms your heart, you will reject this. You will never um, accept this biblical truth. You will always uh, put yourself in a position as that Pharisee, saying, they are the bad people. They are the sinners, not me. But friend, if, like this Pharisee, you are quick to point out the sins in others, and you refuse to look at your own, I'm afraid you need an appointment with a great optometrist, who also happens to be the great cardiologist, who changes and transforms hearts, restores hearts. And we constantly need to see him for both our spiritual vision and, our, and have our hearts checked, and he will adjust whatever needs to be adjusted in your heart. If only you ask him for mercy, and he will answer your prayer. Now look at verse 30 again. Interesting detail here. Jesus Christ waited to perform this miracle inside the house. Obviously, he didn't want this to be public because he asked those two guys, well, I don't want you to share this with anyone else. But yet, he uh, granted uh, these guys what they were asking for, mercy and spiritual as well as physical restoration here. Now, people speculate about the reason why Jesus Christ didn't want this to be public and asked them to not share the details with anyone else. Now, and, and, and there is no reason for speculation, church, and I'll tell you why. Because the answer is in the text. See, if we only read the Bible, if we continue to read, the answer is in the text. And are you ready for the answer? I'll give you the answer. I'll, I'll point out to you the answer from the Bible here. You ready for this? Scripture does not tell us. That's the answer. I'm okay with not having information, are you? You should be okay when, when God withholds information from you. And that's the point here. At, at least this particular passage here, we do not know why Jesus went into the house and performed that miracle privately. Well, uh, obviously we know about it because Matthew, under divine inspiration, recorded it for us now so that now everybody knows. But at that time, Jesus was very clear to those two guys. I don't want you to tell anyone about this. And that's what we know for sure. See, we don't know the reason. What we do know for a fact is that Jesus said, keep this confidential for now. Obviously, people will see what happened to you later. You will witness at the appropriate time. But for now, I don't want you to tell anyone. And that's all we need to know. But what we see here is, um, sadly, that these guys disobeyed a very clear command from Christ. See, their very first opportunity to demonstrate to Jesus Christ that they love Him. They should have kept confidence. They should have honored Him. But who can blame them, right? I mean, they were, they, they were blind, and they were, now they see, and they were, they were happy. They were full of joy. But still, that doesn't justify disobeying the Lord. That's what we see here very clearly. So let's bring this to our reality here, church. I'm sure that these guys had good intentions, the best intentions of heart. And maybe they thought that they were doing Christ a favor. Or maybe they were thinking, maybe, well, I'm doing the Lord's work. What do you mean, don't tell anybody, Lord? I'm, I'm doing your work. But no. And, and you know, we Christians do this a lot. We sprinkle our disobedience with biblical language in order to try to justify our, our rebellious heart. And that's what's going on. Uh, that's what goes on all the time. We do it all the time. We sprinkle biblical language to conceal our disobedience. And when we say s stuff like this, and maybe you, ha you have said some things like this, and maybe you've heard sentences like this. I only want what's best for him or for her. That's why I'm telling you this. Or, the, uh, God, I, I, want, I only want what's best for you. That's why I'm telling you this. But no. Don't conceal your discipline. Just don't do it. The Bible is very clear about that. No matter how noble your intentions, church, nothing, nothing justifies disobeying the Lord. We learned this from Samuel the prophet. 
In 1 Samuel 15, verse 22, he rebuked Saul, the king, because Saul was trying to do the same thing. And he says this, Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. And specifically, church, I want to share with you the divine perspective on violating confidentiality. That's what we see here. These guys violated the confidentiality that Jesus asked them to do. A very simple task. Here's the biblical view of violating confidentiality. He who goes about as a tale bearer reveals secrets, but he who's trustworthy conceals a matter. And that's in Proverbs 11, verse 13. He who's trustworthy conceals a matter. Furthermore, church, let me share with you from the pen of Solomon that God warns us there is a time to be silent and there is a time to speak. And what determines the time to be silent and the time to speak? Your intentions? My intentions? Absolutely not. Why? Because the Bible says the heart is deceitful. So what, is, what determines when it's time to speak and when it's time to be quiet? The Word of God. In other words, if the Bible says very clearly, don't say anything, well, we better keep our mouth shut. We, we better honor what the Bible says to us. Now, on the other hand, if the Bible says, share the good news of the gospel with everyone you meet, then we better obey and we better open our mouths. And by the way, church, for us, modern-day believers, the only non-restricted use of your tongue is when you witness about Jesus Christ. Let me say this again so you can write it down. For us believers, according to Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, the only non-restricted use of your tongue is when you are witnessing about Christ to a sinner. And the text is very clear here. Just like those two blind men, no matter your motivation, when you don't control your tongue, my friend, you are acting like an untrustworthy tail bearer and you are violating his command. And that is a serious matter. Let me quote from James. James eight, uh, uh, 3, verses 8 through 10. No one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come both blessing and cursing. That is a serious warning from the Word of God, friends. When we don't control the tongue. By the way, did you know that the tongue, physically speaking, is a, one of the muscles that is the, one of the strongest muscles in your body? It moves teeth around. And according to the Bible here, it, it causes you to curse people when you don't control your tongue. And we've all done this before. We've all sinned in that area. So what do we do? We ask God to forgive us and we repent and we move on with our lives. We see uh, examples in the New Testament here. Peter was, was known for speaking before thinking right but going back to the story here these two blind mind didn't control their tongues even though christ asked them specifically to not reveal um, what had ha happened to them but as we know nothing will ever frustrate the the, the 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 plans of god not even the disobedience of his people so we have in in this scene here a determined request a divine response and number three i want you to know a dire reality a dire reality in verse 32 now Matthew records now another miracle that fulfills messianic prophecy. You know, interesting here, in the previous verses, he introduced this to two men who spoke too much. And now here, there's a man who spoke too little. In fact, he spoke nothing because he was demon-possessed. And by the way, speaking of controlling the tongue, let me make a disclaimer here. Please tame your tongue and never tell anyone that speech impediment is demonic possession. Because you will hurt people when you say this. You don't have the evidence to claim that. So don't, don't say anything like that. Evidently, what we do know for sure is that demons can interfere in the physical realm. That's obvious from the text here. In this case, particularly one demon or perhaps more, uh, we don't have a lot of details on this. Matthew only dedicates one verse to describe this miracle here. Uh, so one, one demon or more controlled the vocal cords of this guy. But again, we don't have a lot of information here, only that Jesus demonstrates sympathy and compassion and also uh, divine power in controlling and having authority over demons, over the demonic, because he exercised the man here. But here's what I want you to see here at church in terms of application here. Someone brought this man to Christ. Some very faithful friend, some very compassionate friend, perhaps more than one, brought this man to Christ because they realized he's the only one who can take care of his problem. I'm not able to, to, to help this guy, but I know someone who can. And that's the lesson for us, church. 
Now, you may not be able to meet your friend's needs. Perhaps you can give him a, a $20 bill or buy him lunch or whatever the case is, but only Jesus Christ can take care of their greatest need, which is restoration from a spiritual sense, uh, having a fellowship with God restored on the basis of the cross. And you can, the best thing you can do to someone is bring them to Jesus Christ. Like this unknown friend here brought this man. Someone brought him to Christ. So you can say, you don't have to have a theological degree. Did you know that? In order to bring someone to Christ, you don't have to have a seminary degree. You don't have to have a theological degree. All you need to say is, listen, I may not be able to meet your need, but I know someone who can take care of your greatest need. His name is Jesus Christ. Let me introduce you to him. Or you can always bring him to church if you don't know what to say. Come and see. Just like Matthew. He is my sympathetic Savior. He changed my dire reality, and he can change yours. And then give a testimony of your dire reality. Again, non-restrictive use of your tongue. Give them a testimony of now you were blind, but now you see, if you want to quote the hymn. You can do that. Now, Jesus restored that man physically. But Matthew does not tell us whether he became a follower of Christ or not, that particular man. In fact, that's not, again, that's information we don't need to know. That's irrelevant. When we get to heaven, maybe we can ask uh, people around. Hey, you remember that guy from Matthew 9? Uh, what happened to him? Is he around here somewhere? But in the meantime, we don't, we don't need to, to know. We can only hope. But what Matthew does record for us here is the response of other people, which leads me to the next point here. After showing us a determined request, a divine response, and a dire reality, Scripture shows us here a dramatic reaction. Dramatic rea reaction in verse 33. Now, after witnessing Christ's power over demonic activity, the crowds responded in amazement. And the word that Matthew uses to describe their reaction here is the word that uh, describes wonder and marvel even in a fearful kind of a sense here. And he also quotes their unified commentary about the, the, the matter. This was unprecedented in Israel, according to their perspective. Nothing like this has ever happened according uh, to, to, what, to what they perceived. Now, but hopefully, most people made the connection between that unprecedented miracle and the fulfillment of divine prophecy. Because that's what this is all about. Remember, we just read in the beginning of this lesson in Isaiah 29 that the mute will speak, they will actually shout for joy, meaning that Jesus Christ inaugurated the Messianic age. He came offering the kingdom of heaven to people. The Bible says He offered it to His people. His people received them not, but to everyone who receives Jesus Christ. To them He gave the power to become children of God. In other words, you and me, not necessarily, not necessarily Jewish by nature, but we are now sons of Abraham by faith because we received Jesus Christ. So scripture abounds with examples of messianic prophecy, examples of how the Old Testament prophesies specifically about Jesus Christ. In fact, let me give you homework. It's, it's been a while since I've given you some homework here, right? So uh, for your devotional this week, I want you to um, identify in the Old Testament specific prophecies concerning Jesus Christ and see where they find fulfillment in the New Testament, okay? Simple task. The, I'm not going to check your homework. This is for you, for your own edification. This week, you can do that. And that's going to fulfill, that's going to occupy every day of your devotional time. Go to the Old Testament and try to identify prophecies that are referring to the Messiah and Jesus Christ and see if you can identify them in the New Testament. If you have a study Bible, don't cheat. Don't look at your notes first. Go do that as a last resort. Try to do all the research yourself because I don't want to steal the joy of discovery from you. But let me give you one more, okay, to get us started. Isaiah 61, verses 1 through 2. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted and to proclaim liberty to captives and freedom to prisoners. And here's what we see here. Jesus Christ uh, granting uh, freedom to captive, to this man who was captive by uh, demonic oppression and possession in this case. And Jesus Christ freed him, demonstrating to us and to the readers that Messiah is here. He is divine. He is the God-man. He's the Son of God. And He is here to free people. And therefore, we need to listen to Him. He fulfills all the Messianic prophecies. So let's look at the last point of our scene here. We have a determined request, a divine response a dire reality, a dramatic reaction, and finally, number five, verse 34, a disastrous rationale. A disastrous rationale. Now, by now, in the Gospel of Matthew, we have identified 
pharisaical hatred towards Christ, the Pharisees that hated Jesus Christ, along with the scribes too, not just the Pharisees. They, remember, those are political slash religious parties of the time, and they hated Jesus Christ. And shockingly, they were the religious people of that time, and they failed to see that Jesus Christ was the long-awaited Messiah that the Jews were expecting, and they failed that. L listen to their uh, downward spiral. First, they accused him of blasphemy. Remember verse 3. Um, th th these are the scribes, and they say, This fellow blasphemes. Then they criticize him for mingling with sinners. That's in verse 11. They criticize him for loving sinners, for being around sinners, to fulfilling his message to, 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 and his mission to come and save sinners. And then they opposed him for not practicing their outwardly misinterpretation of a ritual, a, a, a spiritual discipline, fasting. That's in verse 14 through 17. You see the opposition against Christ here? And now, after witnessing another demonstration of the divinity of Christ, their, their hearts were so hard that they even refused to consider that this was the Messiah. Perhaps, maybe there's a slight chance that this man is the Messiah. This man is who he claims to be. No, they failed to realize that. Why? Because of their evil hearts. Remember, earlier in the chapter, Jesus Christ identified the evil in their hearts and my friends, what, when you have an evil heart like this, there's no room for grace. There's no room uh, for compassion. See, they didn't deny the legitimacy of the miracle. They just misunderstand, misunderstood and misapplied the source of the authority. They didn't deny that this was a, su a supernatural event, although there's only one verse that describes this particular casting out of that demon. They only ascribed uh, demonic power to Jesus Christ, which is a disastrous conclusion because it leads to their condemnation and Matthew demonstrates then the downward spiral of an evil heart there's hardly any room for grace only accusations and self-righteousness see no one bothered to check the facts they didn't bother to go back to the Old Testament and check and see hmm perhaps there's something here we should look at and tragically again these guys were the shepherds of the people look at verse 36 Actually, yeah, uh, 36, when Jesus says, Seeing the people, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dispirited, like sheep without a shepherd. Why, church? Because their shepherds weren't leading them anywhere. Their shepherds were leading them towards a wrong conclusion about Jesus Christ. And that's why Jesus was so uh, moved and troubled in his heart in verse 36. Now, if only they had opened their Bibles, they would have understood and they would have come to the right conclusion. They would have come to a right understanding of Jesus Christ. And in church, again, this, these are the most religious people of that time, which is alarming. And that's the warning for us. Let me say this slowly so you can write it down or you can type it on your phone. Looking and sounding religious means nothing for God if your heart is not right. Let me say this again. Looking and sounding religious means nothing to God if your heart is not right. And this passage here gives us a clear example of a self-righteous, hypocritical heart that resents the restoration of sinners. You see, rather, the pharisaical mindset prefers to second-guess people's benevolence and pass on judgment. In church, unfortunately, people like that are all over the place. I know a few of them, and you probably know a few of them too. They claim to know the Bible, but they turn against you when you demonstrate Christ-like uh, kindness to other people when you demonstrate the desire to restore a sinner when you forgive people and when you go to Christ uh, you bring them to Christ people will resent you and these are religious folks but I want you to know that according to scripture God can care less about the rituals that we perform outwardly if inwardly the heart is not right that is the point here see let's not let's not miss the sharp warning here of verse 34 Draw a line between verse 34 and verse 13. They're connected. Verse 34 again says, uh, the Pharisees were saying that he cast out demons by the ruler of the demons. In verse 13, Jesus Christ is rebuking people and he says this, go and learn. Go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice. I did not come to call the righteous but sinners. So church, what God wants us to learn is this. Don't follow the pharisaical mindset. Don't follow the hypocritical heart, the self-righteous heart, the highly religious but completely devoid of any compassion heart. Follow the heart of Christ. And the heart of Christ is this, I desire compassion, 
and not sacrifice. Now, let me put this in Pauline language, the language of Paul, so that we can understand. And remember, I've been telling you this. That's a very basic principle of Bible interpretation. This text here that we're reading is not descriptive. I mean, it's not prescriptive. It's descriptive. It's telling us what happened. We can draw applications from it, of course. But let me read you from Colossians 3, which is a prescriptive text. It's telling us what we should do. And this is what Paul says in Colossians 3, verses 12 through 14. As those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. You see, that is a prescription from the Word of God. Put on love. Put on a heart of compassion because you have been chosen of God. See, I can care less about your religiosity, God is telling us. What he says is, instead of being checking the box for all the religious duties you are to, to uh, uh, complete, instead of what I want you to do is put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another, just like the Lord forgave you. Church, if you refuse to forgive anyone... You are putting a wall between your, fellowship, your relationship with God because God, uh, that relationship, that fellowship is interrupted until you forgive others. Why? Because God has forgiven you much. Anything contrary to that reveals a disastrous rationale about the compassion of God, about the compassion of Christ. Now, earlier in the chapter, here's something else I want you to note. Earlier in the chapter, Matthew points out that the gossip started in verse 3. Listen to this again. The scribes said to themselves, this fellow blasphemes. So th th that's how the rumor mill started. That that's the gossip that started. Okay? In, in a small group of people, a small group of scribes. But now, that little gossip went across that community and it went to the Pharisees according to the uh, sequence that Matthew gives us. And again, this is not necessarily chronological, but we're just following the sequence of the narrative here. The Pharisees now went public with their, with their gossip. And this was no longer gossip, but now a slanderous campaign about the identity of Christ. And they went public with their disastrous rationale that Jesus was not who he claimed to be. But church, this is a very serious matter. And I want you to know here, again, God's perspective on this type of thing, of, of gossip. It starts here in a small group of people, you know, two or three, and then all of a sudden... This person tells other person. This person tells another person. And this person tells another person. Before you know it, you have slander going on. You are cursing people with your tongue. I want you to see the perspective of this. Proverbs 16, verse 28. A perverse man spreads strife. And a slanderer separates intimate friends. You see how serious this is, church? Here's a better use of your time. Okay? And again, let me quote you from another prescriptive passage of the New Testament here. Therefore, putting on aside all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slender, like newborn bab babies, long for the pure milk of the word, so that by it you may grow in respect to salvation, if you have tasted the kindness of the Lord. So, church, this is what the word of God tells us. Keep your mouth shut, study the word of God, and then grow by it. Learn from the milk of the word of God in respect to salvation if you have tasted the kindness of God. Again, the only non-restrictive use of your tongue is when you're going to witness to others about Jesus Christ. If you're engaged in any type of slanderous campaign about someone who committed, who, who, who is demonstrating Christ-likeness, you are wrong. Here's something else I want you to see. Did the slander against Jesus affect him in any way church that's a real question let me say it again did the slander against Jesus Christ derail his mission no did he feel the need to stop what he was doing and correct their thinking no did he feel the need to defend himself of course not he had people to save he had other more important things to do he had people to reach lives to restore sheep to shepherd now look at verse uh, 35 again. Jesus was going about his business. He, there, he doesn't even address 
the slander and the gossip. Jesus was going through all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. He was too busy doing uh, his father's business to stop and correct people's uh, slanderous campaign or to even defend himself. He already said what he needed to say in verses 12 and 13, and that's sufficient. Anything more than that would have distracted him from his mission. And my friend, what I want to tell you is this. Let's bring this to our own reality. Those of us who identify with Christ must remember this. Because he had critics and opponents. My friend, you will have critics and opponents. Did you know that? Because Jesus Christ had people talking about him, gossiping, sticking the knife in his back. My friend, the same thing will happen to us if we identify with Jesus Christ. You will be criticized. You will be opposed to your face. So don't, don't let that surprise you. If you hear harsh comments or if you hear that people are making harsh comments because of your Christ-like compassion, your desire to restore the sinner, your desire to forgive. The servant is not greater than his master, John spe- it says in John 13, verse 16, nor is the messenger greater than the one who sent him. So consider it a great honor to be slandered for Christ because people slandered Jesus Christ. Listen to the perspective of the disciples, the, the, the apostles at, by, by this time. Acts 5, verse 41, Luke tells us that after being flogged, they were flogged by the council of the high priests and the Sadducees. By the way, none of us here are going to be flogged, okay? So relax. You may be blogged, but not flogged. The apostles rejoiced after being flogged. And they say this, they rejoiced that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. They rejoiced that they were identifying with Christ, that they considered a great honor to receive shame for his name. In church, if you identify with Christ and you're doing what he wants you to do, do, you will have opposition. But what do you do? Continue to do what you've been doing until God decides you're done. Do absolutely nothing to defend yourself. Focus your energy in doing what God wants you to do until he decides you're done. Until his, he decides, well, here's a new season of ministry for you. But don't do anything prematurely. Don't waste your time trying to defend yourself. Don't waste your time trying to justify your motives. Just continue to do what you do. Just like the Pharisees accused Jesus Christ of working for the devil, people will speak very harsh things about you. Eventually, Jesus moved from that region. It was at the right time, not because of this, at the divinely appointed time, but he never stopped demonstrating compassion towards people just because other people said anything about him. In church, likewise, we do not care about the approval of men, do we? We care about the approval of God. We're working for Him. Now, and, and read Galatians. But that's what Paul is talking about all the time. Now, if we're, if we're after the approval of men, we're in trouble. We're not after the approval of men. We're after the approval of God. And Jesus Christ demonstrates that very clearly here. After being slandered, He just goes on with His business. Doesn't even address the, the issue. He continues to do what uh, His Father wants Him to do. Again, if you're a servant of Christ... You are after his approval, no matter the cost, and it will cost you greatly. So for that reason, I want to remind you what I said to you this morning. Jesus, uh, in the beginning, Jesus' power to restore confirms his divinity and his sympathy. Again, sympathy is another word for compassion. It means to suffer with. It means to, to hurt for people who are hurting. And that's what we see here. Jesus Christ, our sympathetic high priest, the great king, the majestic savior. So... I can't promise you he'll restore your physical problems like he did with those guys here. But he will revive your soul. So if you are not yet a believer in Christ, uh, here's what he promises to you. John 6, verse 35, I am the bread of life, and he who comes to me will not hunger. And he who believes in me will never thirst. Furthermore, he says, whoever drinks the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternal life. And finally... Uh, John 10, verse 9, I am the door, he says. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and find pasture. And even in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Christ says, enter through the narrow gate. And he offers himself, I am the door. I am the way by which you can be saved. But the only way that you can have a relationship with the Father. So come today to Jesus Christ, friend, and be restored if you are outside of Christ. If any of you here are not yet a follower of Jesus Christ, He'll forgive you of your sins and He will grant you eternal life. That's a promise from the Word of God. And no promise of the Word of God goes um, 
and uh, it can be broken. And for those of you who know him already, let me affirm you one more time. Let me affirm to you one more time. God is not dead in 2020. He is alive, and he did not die. So let's remove the mourner's robe. You have nothing to be sad about. We have, we have reason to celebrate. Our joy is unspeakable. Now, the challenges of this season are meant to draw us closer to him. Consider this, so that he can wean us from the world. The more you desire Christ, the less you desire the world. And I thank God for this crazy year that we've been facing so far, for all, all the anxiety that comes with it, because it's at least to me, and I see that I've been on my knees more than ever before, praying to God and, and, and praying for you, for this church, and, and uh, for family members and for people who need uh, salvation. And um, I encourage you to do the same. Why? Because Jesus, power has, Jesus Christ has the power to restore. And he is, uh, he is compassionate. He's, he's divine and sympathetic. And he cares about people. In fact, the Bible says, cast your cares upon him and he will sustain you. And uh, but Paul says in Philippians, uh, don't be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So the question is this, uh, church, this morning. Do you want to have your mind and your, and your heart guarded? Then present your request to God, not because you need to inform Him, but because you need to articulate your need for Him. Let's do that now. Father, thank you for this opportunity to open the Word of God this morning and study about the restoration power of the gospel and of Jesus Christ, Lord. What a, what a feast, Lord, these last couple of weeks studying about the personality, the individuality, and the identity of Christ, Lord, and we fall in love with him even more, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that that, that love we have for him will translate into a tangible fruit in a way that we will talk to people about him. We will make non-restrictive use of our tongue to witness about Jesus Christ so that other people can be saved, other people can come to him, Lord. And, uh, Lord, we, we, we love to talk about him. We, we, we talk about the people that are important to us. I talk about my family all the time, Lord. It shouldn't be a, a stretch to talk about my Savior, Lord, and the one who gave me eternal life, the one who restored me, the one who uh, caused me to see when I was blind, spiritually speaking. So thank you for your great love for us, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that this, uh, the, 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 this saving message will always be in our lips here at Grace Baptist Church, Lord, that nothing else, Lord, that we, will, that we will restrict the use of our tongue before we consider gossiping or talking about anyone else, Lord, but that we will talk about Jesus Christ, that that will occupy our time and our minds, Lord, we pray. We love you, uh, Lord, and we pray, Father, that uh, this week even, when we distribute those baskets, Lord, you will give us opportunities to share the gospel, Lord, with people, to, to, to tell them, um, our neighbors, the, 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 the hope that's in us, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.